Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, August 22nd, 2021. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. <laughs> that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number uh, 612. And we have a guest, Edward Angelini Cook. Yay! 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 And uh, Damon is uh, currently on assignment uh, uh, dealing with uh, new pets, uh, new cubs, and new bears. World bears, I believe, right? That, yes, that right? he is. He actually uh, not only is attending World Bear Weekend in, in Tennessee, which is wrapping up this weekend, he also was a part of the competition. He did not compete, but he was helping someone with their with certain portions so he oh. was kind of uh i, was, I guess I was, I was expecting to say that he was the tally whacker he's no 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 he Definitely. like an entourage uh, i don't know how to like um he wasn't <laughs> this is gonna be a horrible thing to say he wasn't <laughs> stage bomb he was literally like part of the support staff i guess i would say okay because he he actually was on stage for someone's like one of the portions of the competition, like one of the, I guess, stages, phases, steps that you get, um, you know, in the competition for one of the contestants. So I did not know that was happening. The only way I know is because someone sent me a super secret message of an image and there's David on stage. And I was like, oh, oh OK, <laughs> I was like, well, look at you. <laughs> so Girl, you've been hiding something from us. Might have, well, might have been, I think, or or it might have been it. something that he was wrangled into it when he got there. No, knowing knowing who it was and stuff, I think it was definitely planned out in advance. I think there just wasn't a discussion about it, like it wasn't kind of a, a public knowledge. And I realize as I'm talking about it now, I might be like spilling tea that's not mine to spill. So, oops. Um, <laughs> but but I will say this um, that. We're excited because uh, World Bear, World Cub, and World Pet titles were given out last night, and two of the three of them are former guests of our show. So, yay! Woo! Right, yeah. So, Pupzio and uh, James. Yeah. Cub, uh, for, for Pet and Cub, respectively, from the way I said it. So oh, um, James was on back when we discussed Glitter Bear uh, and from years ago, and AJ has been on in various ways um, over time. And so, yeah, I'm, 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 yay! I'm very happy. I was so I knew that the titles were being given out last night, and there was kind of a competition. And I ended up posting on Twitter. The irony was not lost on me because I was actually watching a video from 2019 about Mr. International Rubber. Um, cause there's a new YouTube, well, new to me, I should say YouTube channel that I've really started binging recently and it's kink focused. And so I was watching it and they were talking about like being at MIR and what it's like and what happens. And while, uh, they're going over literally the competition section, I get my kind of super secret message from inside scoop, uh, announcing that uh somebody had won who i know and so i got all excited and then i was i felt very um <laughs> and i don't know if there's a term for this i felt very emotionally trapped because i wanted to tell everyone and then i realized i probably can't 
because like it's not mine to tell. <laughs> so there were people I was going to reach out and tell that I was like, oh, but maybe I shouldn't because like maybe they want to tell. So let them say it and I'll repost. Yeah. So I felt bad because like there were some people that um, are good friends that I know that are friends, you know, so I was just like, oh, OK, I guess I won't say anything. Very awkward. Mm. But those are old relationships. <laughs> that they are. So, uh, Ed, you're joining us today because we're continuing our landscape of relationship series and we're discussing something I've never heard of before. MREs. Sorry, I mean NRE. New Relationship Energy. Yeah, I'm uh, generally shocked that you have not heard of New Relationship Energy. Well, I'm pretty sure I've experienced it because I've been in relationships not in quite a while. Um, yeah. But, you know, I was like, oh, OK, that's a thing. But it makes sense. Yeah. Like what, what I've read ahead a little bit based on some of your notes and stuff. So help us understand what this uh, thing is. I don't think it's a phenomenon. I think it's been around for quite a while, I'm going to guess. Um, yeah, it's been it's literally been around since the dawn of time probably um uh and um but um this is also yeah this is something that we've all experienced in one at one time or another um but with, within the poly community this is a term that they use um that you know i generally use in my practice to help manage these feelings that come up um, when we're managing multiple relationships. Um, so I have a question. How many songs do you know of that link love to addiction or drugs or being high? Okay, I didn't realize there was going to be a karaoke ask kind of quiz. Um, I don't know a number. I mean, I would say probably quite a fair amount. Although what's strange is what immediately comes to mind is like my teenage years, I think is when I was aware of this. Um, like this is probably not exactly matching that, but I think immediately of like Tiffany's, I think we're alone now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And how it was like this pop sensation, but it's about like being youthful and kind of being in love and like there's a secrecy to it, but like it's exciting. Like, do you know what I mean? Like that's that's probably not exactly what you mean. But no, I, I mean, I imagine that's a thing. Um, most relationship like love infatuation kind of songs, I would think, are mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, actually, you know. it made it with well, it was made popular by Tiffany. It was originally done by Tommy James and the Chandels. <laughs> actually, a Tommy James and the Chandels song. Actually, <laughs> hashtag actually, and hashtag <laughs> actually. When I was in my teen years, I was only aware of the Tiffany song. Yeah. So right. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like someone recently was talking. I can't remember what the song was. They mentioned something and it's a, it's a, um, I guess what we call a May December relationship. And so the older partner made a reference to a song and the original and then the, the younger individual, the couple was like, Oh, you mean like what Dua Lipa did? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Oh, wow. Oh, that's a thing. Child. Now. That's, that's, that's a thing now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome to getting older. Yay. Anyways. Right. So to your point, uh, Edward, uh, that we have um, probably quite a lot of songs that are about the, I guess it's a way that we tell the story of the flood of hormones. Like, I don't know how else to explain that. Like, the chemical changes that happen with us when. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, so uh, when. Um, when I talk about love, um, you know, the research talks about early stages of love is very similar to being on drugs. Um, and 
the music industry, uh, like artists, use that um, because it's it's an experience that we all have had. And there are a lot of songs that, um, you know, that that use this um, romance as addiction, um, you know, and uh, so I I even linked a article by Rolling Stone that uses that like the first one here is Huey Lewis and the News. I want a new drug or um, mm. uh, like Kelly Clarkson has a song addicted. Right. Like we we have this this feeling like we're addicted to somebody when we're. When we're first, uh, you know, uh, you know, seeing somebody, right? Peter and yeah, exactly. So this um, this Perfect. stage, um, uh, this stage is called uh, in the research. It's called limerence, um, and it was uh, identified or, or first described by a psychologist by the name of Dorothy uh, Tenev. Um, and uh, she talks about this in her book uh, in 1979 called Love and Limerence uh, to describe the, the, the phenomenon of these thoughts, these, these, these feelings and these behaviors that we have in the beginning of a relationship. Uh, like, like we'll call it like having a crush um, or Twitter pated, right? And these like, so I'm sure that you have this, right? Like, or you've had these, these feelings, right? They are like categorized as being very in- intrusive thoughts. Uh, like everything seems to be about this one person. We can't listen to the radio because every song is seems to be about that person. Um, everything we do seems to remind us about this. But all we want to do is talk about this person. They become the central focus in our life kind of like a black hole of attraction um and you know sometimes that uh is reciprocated (laughs) Mm -hmm. um and and so that's that's limerence um and new relationship energy is similar um but within the polyamorous community it is uh, used to describe and manage those feelings in the context of already existing relationships. Uh, because if you can imagine, when we have those feelings, when when all we can do is like focus on one person, um, it can sometimes create might create feelings of jealousy among existing relationships. So like it's it's something that we have to manage. So that's why they call it new relationship energy, right? Um, hmm. And this is often a hot topic, right? Because it comes up often, right? Anytime that we uh, that we encounter a new relationship, this is going to happen. And why this is going to happen is, uh, do you know the song "Your Love Is a Drug" by Kesha? Nope. Not offhand, but if I hear it, I might recognize it. I don't know. You know, um, okay, well, that's not a good example. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also like, not into po- uh, listening to m- music much this past, like, 10 years. So all right, if, it, if it's um, garbage, I'll probably have listened to it. <laughs> that's about it. So, Rob- yeah. so Robert Palmer, Addicted to Love. Mm-hmm. Addicted to love. Right. We know that song. Okay. So uh, the same chemical reactions, right, so the same chemical reactions that happen neurologically during the limerence phase of a new relationship are also happening during crack cocaine addiction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the relationship gives us all of those feel-good dopamine and norepinephrine uh, feelings uh, that are similar with uh, when we're high on on cocaine, um, like those obsessive thoughts. Um, and when we're not with that person, we have those obsessive thoughts, right? Like, uh, what are they doing? Why aren't they calling me? What's happening, right? Um, almost similar to withdrawal. And what's happening is we're experiencing low serotonin production at those times, um, which and low serotonin is what satiates us and lets us know that we're full, right? Like we've had enough. Um, 
So like when we're in a new relationship, we're never, we're like Alexander Hamilton. We're never going to be satisfied in those early months. We just want it all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for those that haven't seen Alexander Hamilton, the musical, that last reference wouldn't make sense, but um, no, I, I see what you mean. The one thing I wanted to say for what you were just talking about, Ed, that struck out to me was, not only could there be jealousy like in a, in a poly situation, but there can just be jealousy in even uh, like a monogamous relationship. It's not the relationship, like the two people that are in the relationship, but it's family and or friends outside of that. Um, right. You're that different types get, of relationships. Right. Like that get bent out of shape because they're like, like these are common things I've heard in the past, not to me, but like as like tropes, I guess, or examples, you know, you never seem to have time anymore. You're always busy with this person. It's always, it's always blah, 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 blah. You know, like, like people reflect back their discomfort because you are, I guess, exuding new relationship energy. Like, and they have to face that there's a new development in your personal life that doesn't include them. Right. So out of poly context, we would call that limerence, the limerence phase, right? Okay. In in like in like um um poly like just regular like one-on-one context, right? That would just be like the limerence phase. In poly context, like when there's when there is like a multi relationship dynamic, that's when like we would use new relationship energy. So it's kind of like the same thing. Um, it's just that like, it's, it's, it's just a different dynamic. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think that from an outside perspective, people might not quite see the difference of it, but yeah. If right. So it's, it's more about familiarity. Like I, we had said we weren't familiar with NRE before. So I was like, what? Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it, it's it's seeming to me, and th- this is how I'm per- perceiving it. The the kind of reason is because it's a new of the same type of relationship. When in the when you're talking about in the poly community, so it actually kind of is has a different sort of interaction with the relationship interactions. I'm I'm not sure if I'm communicating this correctly because. Limerence is you're my family, you're my just my friend, you're not like lover, partner, person. While in the poly relationship, it's it's a new romantic relationship in addition to your old romantic relationships. Because they're the same type of relationship, it kind of affects people a little bit differently. Does that make sense? And oh my... Yeah, and we'll 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 get into that. And so it makes it um uh it adds a extra complexity and like nuance. Um and the other the other ways um that I talk about this uh are when I'm working with substance abuse clients, right? Um I'm often telling them it's a recommendation for the first year of recovery that they don't get into a relationship because uh, new, uh, like the limerence phase can mirror addiction, <laughs> right? Can limerent, uh, can mirror the, the, the feeling of being high, right? So it can be a trigger to want to go get high. Um, so it's not always a safe space, right? For, people new in um relation uh new in recovery okay so i think there's sort of an overlap my question is like how does limerence or new relationship energy relate to infatuation so it is kind of the same thing um they they they're kind of um like we we're kind of talking about the same so infatuation is a kind of is part of the limerence um 
experience, right? Because when we are going through new relationship energy, when we're in the limerence phase, there is like infatuation. We are um, like, we're going to talk about cons of new relationship energy um, within the context of like poly dynamics. Um, but, um, but with infatuation, right? Like we are eight, like we're only seeing the positives, right? Of somebody, right? We're just like over, over the moon with somebody. Right. So here's part of why I asked, because, um, I went in the, the live chat had asked about, uh, there's the song, I will possess your heart by death cab for cutie. Mm -hmm. And so in looking over the lyrics, the perspective is about someone being infatuated with another person, mm -hmm. but it not being reciprocated necessarily. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking, like, how much infatuation is like an element of it, because I think there's as we're going to talk about, like the pros and cons, I think there's multiple facets to pretty much everything. Um, well, and that's. And that's why I said that, like, um, like when it comes to the limerence phase, right, like sometimes that's reciprocated, right? Like, you know, um, you know, sometimes I will have a crush on somebody um, and it's not reciprocated, right? Sometimes I'll be infatuated okay. with somebody and it's not reciprocated. And right. sometimes that can be um, that can negatively impact my life. Um so it right, could because, be like infatuation is like a slightly a precursor possible going into an overlap into those that phase. And, like, and sometimes yep, and sometimes that can become obsessive, right? We're kind of talking right. about like 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 I think in the context that we're talking about is like when it is reciprocated, mm -hmm. when you know, when there is the uh, you know, um that energy is flowing between like two people, you know what I mean? Right. So it's possible that you could have an infatuation with somebody um, and it's and it's pre new relationship energy. Like if you're intrigued, interested, really drawn to a person, it may not be reciprocated right away, but that could develop. It's not a promise. Don't anybody kind of start jumping to conclusions. Um you know, and it is, it's it's an interesting path to go through, like, emotionally, psychologically, because you're really interested and intrigued in someone. Um, and it could be, like, a slow burn. It could be over a very long period of time, or it could be very quickly develop. Like, you could just meet somebody and be completely swept off your feet um, in, in a very short period of time, and it could develop very rapidly. And then whether or not it's reciprocated, I think, is where it starts to determine if it becomes NRE. because if they're not interested, then that's a whole other path of of your mindset and how you process and deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, like I am looking at. Uh, yeah, it's like a very early, early stage of. Um, of this mm -hmm. um, stage. Right. So it's very new. Like infatuation is like the very early stage of that newness feeling of a relationship. Or even pre-relationship. Yeah. Right. I, I kind of think of it more as like a pre-relationship. Like it's not a it's not a foundational requirement. Um, because sometimes I think it, and it could be imbalanced. Like you could have one person that's really developing an infatuation with the other and in this case the other we'll say like you know person b doesn't see things the same way but also may be just oblivious may not be aware that the other person is interested in them or mm -hmm. you know has an has an infatuation and it isn't until that comes to the forefront that they're made aware of it that they're like oh okay cool like i guess i hadn't really thought of that or you know didn't cross my mind or, or whatever so situation is like kindling to a fire yeah because because well you can use kindling it it kind of starts as burning burning stuff whether the corresponding fuel to actually have the actual fire actually ignites that's another matter altogether okay so like um so i'm looking at something right now um where 
the like infatuation is what comes kind of before limerence, mm -hmm. right? So limerence is kind of like what is also called like the honeymoon phase. Okay. So it's like the shallow end of the honeymoon phase. <laughs> okay. So it's like the feeling of like foolish or obsessively strong love or mm -hmm. uh, um, admiration for or interest in someone or something without substance. Right. Um, like I don't like I can be infatuated with some someone. I know nothing about them. <laughs> They're really cute. I okay. saw them do this once. Which this takes me back to like my youth, so to speak, like when, you know, you go through the early phases of puberty and I'm not talking about like the physical, but I'm well, it is kind of physical, but it's not external. It's internal, like how the chemical changes within your within your body affect your brain and like how you process and think things uh, or see things. And so what you were just describing it, I think is like classic to see a person that's most likely a celebrity and you end up putting pictures all over the walls in your bedroom or a poster. Mm -hmm. I realize the youth today may not do that as much. Um, <laughs> Pre-internet, we used to do a lot of that. Um, and so you would kind of become uh i don't like using this word but does anyone think comes to mind like obsessive like you would take the you know on this strong infatuation with an individual and there would be kind of a fantasy element to it and it's incredibly non-realistic i want to phrase it that way because i will own this like when i was in my youth i seriously thought one day i might meet and have some kind of a relationship with garth brooks and was not pleased at all that he ended up getting married uh, I was just like, what? What is this business? Like, obviously, I am destined to meet him one day. Like, that's just, you know, no. Um, and then as I grew up as and became more of an adult and realized, like, how unhealthy that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> and unrealistic, um, you know. And to a I woman, still, nonetheless. That's even more of a friend. Really? Like, how egregious? I mean. Trisha Yearwood? Really? Oh, you want to talk about a scandal? I was like completely beside myself when that came out. That like that whole, anyways. So, uh, but yeah. but I do do hear that they're actually pretty pretty good couple. <laughs> right, I understand that they're a pretty good couple, and I'm I'm happy that they're happy, and the man is still fine, and I love the fact that he's getting older and he's still just as sexy and handsome as ever. Anyways, anyways, the point that. the point of this subject is, or this show is not about him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's definitely a, a, a thing that we potentially go through. I mean, not everybody, you know, not everyone's the same, but I think that's kind of a common experience as you kind of develop your understanding of yourself and your interest in other people. Well, so like one of the things that uh, that I think is important that I think we're going to talk about next month is that we don't have we have very little control over our emotions and we have also very little control over our hormones and our, you know, neurotransmitters that is going on inside of our body. Um, and so like, sometimes we're going to resist that. And uh, a lot of times that's going to have the opposite result. Um, so like, I don't know, i I think that it's important to have some wherewithal about kind of what's going on, which we'll talk about with NRE, but like, it, NRE feels good, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes like just go with the flow, right? Like don't resist it. Don't try to, sh don't try to like fight against it because it'll make it worse. Um, and so like some of that like infatuation, some of that like puppy love is part of the process. And in order to get to that mature love or that, um, you know, the later stages, we kind of have to get through some of those really good feeling. So like, you know, uh, Gary, you were talking about sometimes like our friends or our family member are going to roll their eyes and they're going to be like, you know, they're going to say things. Um, but they've, they've been there too, <laughs> right? Like they felt that way too. Right. Um, and sometimes we just need a, uh, and we'll talk about with the, what to do when you're in NRE, is to have supportive people to allow you to go down that river. Right. And I think there's one thing I want to, I guess, 
respond back to not so much in a debate is that I think people forget that. So exactly. I think the people who express jealousy or discontent or irritation at the sudden rush of public displays of affection and all the focus and energy and talk about this new relationship, this other person, I think if they had experienced it, they've forgotten it. Like the the rush of the hormones and all those things that they went through, if if they did, uh, has waned or it's been so long that they've forgotten what it's like, which I find interesting because like I agree with you, you know, that they I think it's kind of displaced their their perspective about things. Um, and, you know, it, it is it, it, it is a whole experience unto itself and that some people might kind of forget what it was like, you know, to, to be in that, because I don't know, it's been 20 some years for some people or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, I also think that, um, oh, I had a, um, a thought that just went out of my head. So I'm going to let it come back when it comes back. Well, and I think people find it difficult to appreciate other people's happiness and I don't know how else to say that other than to put it kind of bluntly that way. I feel this I, I feel that times that we we don't like being discontented. And when you see other people in content or happy or joyful or, you know, any of these positive things and we're not in that place, I think it's very difficult, especially for I'm gonna say for Americans given our culture to be supportive of another person when it makes us measure ourselves. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. so we're, we, we be, we become critical because my life is not like that. And I feel like, Oh, you know, my relationship isn't as good or as romantic or whatever. Um, you know, my life, my life is not that. Therefore I kind of get, pissy and bitter like i i turn in a in an odd direction as opposed to being supportive you know and being happy for them and those type of things and i think that's really far more reflective about your internal stuff that's going on um and what's happening with that and like i <laughs> this is kind of a side where real briefly i've been having some issues with work and I have I have a roadblock that I've been trying to address and deal with. And I flat out said to one of my coworkers, I was like, you know what? Maybe they're just having a bad life right now and it's coming through their work. And my coworker, who this I was just venting to, laughed. They thought that was so funny that I had such an interesting perspective that I was like, maybe they're just being a bitch because their life sucks. I don't know that, <laughs> but I'm trying to figure out a way as to why they're being so much of a pain in my ass. Like and the other and my coworker who I was venting to was like, well, that's interesting. <laughs> you took that stance. And I was like, well, I got nothing to work off of here. I just know that they're being very difficult. I'm trying <laughs> to be empathetic. We're ha <laughs> we've been having a, I've been having a, a discussion about relationships with a, a professional for the past like the six months. <laughs> so now I'm starting to think of these things. Um, well, no, I, I always I always try to keep an, a, a bigger perspective. I know mm -hmm. I'm not good at it because sometimes it's very it's very easy to be insular and have like a, you know, a very telescopic, you know, closed view. And, you know, and there's a part of me that's like, I, I don't have the full picture. I'm only seeing pieces of this puzzle. It's very difficult to engage and understand what's happening with them and why they're coming at me the way that they are like why their communication is not necessarily ideal you know there's a, there's a whole bunch of layers to this anyways my point is when you take a moment to have a broader perspective i think it's a little bit easier to see and understand things but back to my earlier comment i think it's difficult in american culture because we're very egotistical and self-centered and it's so strange to me because we have this i'm going to just call it out we have a fucked up dichotomy of you know be an American, be a proud individual, you know, you can do it. You can achieve any dream that you want, but you better toe the line, gosh darn it. And you better be like everybody else. Cause it's the only way you're going to be accepted is to be part of the common collective. Also, I don't think the American dream, uh, uh exists anymore. It kind of died somewhere in like the sixties or seventies or somewhere around there. 
as capitalism well, slowly, slowly moved up. But that's another matter altogether. Completely. No, no, no. But I mean, the, the point is, is that I think, you know, we have a very conflicted modern viewpoint of things. We have generations that like have different mindsets about what is what it is to be a person, what it is to be a member of society, what it means to be engaged. And like, there's always been this kind of conflict about, I mean, I remember when I was young and uh, in school, and I think this was after my parents had divorced, uh, my father had kind of said something really profound to me in which he relayed to me, listen, the people that are around you right now, you call them your friends, in 20, 30, 40 years from now, they may not necessarily be your friends. And it's not that they're bad people. And it's not that like, you know, that you're going to have, you're going to have a falling out or, you know, you're going to have like fights or whatever life changes. And while you are going to work so hard right now to be accepted by them, to be a part of them. So you have to have the gap genes, you have to, you know, have a certain hairstyle or whatever. It isn't going to matter in time. Like my dad was trying to instill in me some wisdom as an adult because he was already aware in his what thirties of what I was dealing with in my teens, my early teens and how like I desperately wanted to be accepted and included. And he was like, he didn't say it this way, but it was kind of like the message underlying. It was like, kid, this doesn't matter. <laughs> like it matters to you now, but it will not matter in the bigger picture. Like in time to come, it ain't going to be a big deal. And that's really difficult, I think, for people to process. And the parallel to that, I think, in our discussion back to the topic is where you are going to have an experience that's unique to you and other people will see it from a different view and it may not always jive. Like not everyone's necessarily going to be supportive and engaged and excited for you. And that doesn't it's not good or bad. I think it's just about perspective. And sometimes it really is about them and not about you. And it is your responsibility to find your support, right? So, uh, you know, when people aren't, especially during this time, when people aren't supportive of these hormonal things that are going on, it could create feelings of shame and guilt um, in us. And that can have uh, not great reactions uh, that can. So the, the goal for this is when we're feeling NRE, we're feeling very insecure in our in our in what's kind of going on the goal is to get to security because that's what like love is right forming an attachment with somebody right like in early stages we're very uh we're insecure in this attachment so like we want to get to um security so when somebody is t when the messages that you're getting to some from somebody are this isn't normal um you know uh I think that you're you're doing this wrong. It's not pushing you in the right direction. Uh, so um, we want to hang around those people that are supporting what we're doing while also uh, making sure that our feet are on the floor. So well, wait, wait. I, I've been wanting to talk about some uh, in relation to this because, uh, like, looking at somebody who's trying to be supportive to somebody who's currently under NRE because I can tell you there's certain times when I have seen some things that I've been trying to unhappy for them I want them to succeed at the this relationship but I see them doing things that are cons sometimes questionable behavior that is uncharacteristic e.g. moving mm. big purchases such as well, one red flag for me uh, that I kind of be be like, hey, I want this to succeed for you, but you're doing what? No, we, you, I, I don't. You should you should do just let it develop for a while. Let it develop. Oh, you're moving in with them already. Or like Jeff, like you're pointing out, like I just I was thinking about this recently. Someone revealed to me an acquaintance of mine in a previous relationship kind of early in the relationship the two individuals went together and bought a house and they are no longer a couple and only one of them resides in the house and that's a that's a whole thing to process a financial burden issue mm -hmm. based on decisions that you made potentially during nre um and so i agree with you like there there are definitely things that kind of stand out and what i wanted to say was uh not to counterbalance what you're saying ed but there's i think there's a it's an interesting 
dance. I don't know how else to pro- how else to say it. Like when you're going through NRE and whether or not you're you're finding support, I just want to balance it and say if you're not getting support, perhaps maybe very slim chance uh, that there's a reason you're not getting the support because maybe this is not a healthy relationship. Yeah. So like, um, so one of the things is like, we're kind of talking about, but there is a lot of community wisdom here. Like we know what are some pros and we know what, what some cons are when it comes to limerence and also NRE right within monogamous relationships and also in open and poly relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. So like we need to be, aware of that and also talk about that instead of denying it and not talking about it right Mm -hmm. so like jeff mentioned like some like total cons of nre um and also limerence right is we we hyper focus on this new relationship and we neglect other relationships and responsibilities in our lives um it 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 increases the likelihood that we're going to negatively evaluate um our other partners behaviors right like we're going to become critical um because we're going to like hold this new partner or potential partner on a pedestal um and we're we're sometimes going to have questionable behavior because we're not thinking rationally the only thing that we're doing is we're feeling because all we have are these good feelings because we're high Right. Um, so like we're we're more likely to to make big moves and to make big purchases and we're willing to overlook mm. red flags, uh, like Jeff said. So like we it's really important that we have these conversations that like this can happen. We have to be aware of this. And that's what you know, we'll, we'll talk about what to do in this. Right. Um, so that we have that community wisdom um so that we can hold each other accountable for for these things and you can be supportive but still be you know the kind of the the kind of the counterbalance for that when you're speaking of the person outside of the 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 support person uh you can be the one that kind of just goes in and be like like hey i love that you have this energy but I need to like stop you there. Let's let's rein it back just a little bit and be supportive enough to be like, you're making a questionable decision. Let's talk about that. Smooth down. Let's calm down on that part. Okay. Continue on. I'm not stopping you from the relationship or anything. Just trying to rein you in a little bit just to make mm-hmm. sure that you, that all, basically to ca- help the person counteract any of the cons of, of the battery limit limit and to hold and, and to hold you accountable right yeah. um to say like you know this this is like this is what's happening you know that this is what's happening right like these are the things that you need to do but that you you know can do right um so that these things don't happen. These are like, these are the things that can happen. These are the negative things that can happen. And we don't want that to happen. I want to support you, but I also want, I don't want you to get yourself into a situation that you can't get yourself out of. Right. And I think really what we're talking about is that is rebalancing emotions versus like logic. So. And rationality. Right. So like, you know, facts as opposed to feelings. Um, it's something I used to do a lot of, uh, focus on in corporate training. Like when you talk with individuals, there's, you have to recognize that there are multiple things under the surface that are going on. So when you're presenting something to someone, there's, there's like the way they feel about it, but then there's also like the hard facts about the situation or the thing, whatever it is. And like, it takes a, it, it is, a, it's an act, you know, it takes a skill to kind of balance those things. And from what we're discussing, NRE can have a high preponderance of like feelings that outweigh like the the reality, the you know the facts, the you know however you want to phrase it, um, and kind of bringing that back, I think a little bit more into balance. So like what Jeff was just mentioning, I think is about telling someone, you know, like I'm not against 
the fact that you found somebody and that like, you know, this is great and all that kind of stuff, I would just be cautious about some of the decisions that you make. I mean, you know, one of the things that we were discussing about is like behaviors that change. I completely agree with that. Like there's a, I think there's a large percentage of individuals that start doing things that they don't normally do. And they use it as a way of expressing their interest in the other person or their love for them. I think yeah. of it really, especially in financial terms, like suddenly they go out to eat three, four, five times a week and they go to the movies, you know, they do all these external things while they may not financially be okay to handle all of that. Yep. And like, you know, I think it, that's where being a good supportive person would be to say, hey, <laughs> like logical per uh, here, I, I'm just going to play your logic circuits. For a while here, your logic circuits aren't quite working right now. So I'm I'm just gonna fill in the gap. Let's talk about this. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. And 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 Jeff, what you just said is is absolutely perfect. And that's what I would want anybody to say to to say like if we if like if we were in a, a relationship structure, right? And I saw somebody new, I would want you to be like, hey, I understand that you're all feeling right now. Let me uh, let me play some of your rationale, your you know your rational uh, part right now, right? Like you're Film you're not hitting that button not right, now. For you right now. Yeah, exactly. And like like it's okay, it's okay. Like you don't have control over that right now. I will like let me let me help you with that, right? That's what I'm here for. Right, and and I think that's what's part of a good support structure is that someone's able to provide you that balance and that outside perspective to kind of talk to you about some of your behaviors that are being exhibited, that they're witnessing, because they could be long-term negative effects that you're not paying attention to. So, like, this isn't the same thing, but and it makes me think about how previously we had discussed about how, like, you know, um, people in certain moments – um, make decisions that are not in their best interest in the long term, but they make sense right now. And that being like exposing themselves to things that are not good for them. Exactly. You know, I, I think of like the work that I do with HIV and adjacent to like sexually transmitted infections, like people are not taking a moment to put their their best interest first. I mean, they are, but they're not. You know, they're not they're not taking a moment to kind of reevaluate the the um, you know, the reality of the situation and asking the questions in the moment to be like, you know, when did you last get tested and what were those test results and do you know what your status is? Like, you know, um, because understandably that may be discomforting. It may put the brakes on something that's, you know, happening yeah. very quickly that you're really excited and interested in, um, you know, and then afterwards there are these effects that you have to deal with and that's part of you know, what we do in, in public health is talking to people about, you know, the decisions that they've made and the consequences for those actions. And it's not exactly enjoyable because, you know, people, I, I understandably, people are not open to being told that they perhaps did not make the best decision. You know, whatever yep. that may be. And, and on the alternate side, also taking the support of like when they are doing something which, well, might not necessarily be entirely rational logic circuit says oh yeah that's okay the, to to go ahead and encourage them, like i'm going to date with this person oh really what are you do, gonna do and you, you talk to them to encourage them as well as you know finding those red flags to pull them back so it's kind of a back and forth sort of thing encouragement or rain in i don't want to say discouragement right uh, well, no, it's, I think it really is about balancing. Like I'm, I'm constantly mm. seeing this as like, you know, kind of like the teeter totter effect. Like, you know, where do you find that, that good mix of things between like your, your positive excitement and energy and tempering it with, you know, the, the reality from, I guess, a different perspective. Relationships are like chocolate. The good stuff is tempered. Oh, very nice. Um, so, <laughs> so, so we've kind of talked about some cons of NRE, but like, let's talk about some good stuff that comes with NRE. So we've talked about the fact that, um, there are some happy, uh, feelings that are associated with, uh, with NRE, right? You got a, a, a surge of dopamine coursing through your veins. 
use that, right? Like um, that is a very good thing. The kind of negative thing, right, um, is we have uh, low serotonin, right? Um, so what you might want to do is uh, you might want to do things that help boost up your serotonin levels. Um, so like that may be to if you are not a person who does to-do lists, you may want to become a person who do, does to-do lists so that you can have that sense of completion. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is that you're going to have increased energy. Um, so that's not a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's good. And then the other thing is you're going to be, uh, your, your, the likelihood that you're going to try new things is going to increase. Also, like, uh, like Gary said, um, you may do things that you didn't do before because the new person that you're interested in may want to do those things. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad thing. Um, like I tried raw tuna. <laughs> because of uh, somebody that I was interested in. I never would have done that before. Um, and it wasn't terrible. Um, way to go. Thanks, Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, that is <laughs> so not what I thought you were about to say. Anyways. Um, um, I never had and, actual really good sushi. All the sushi I've had have been like grocery store sushi. <laughs> Maybe I'll actually try sushi, and I'm not even a fish eating person, so. Right. So, you know, these are these are pros of NRE. And then the other thing that I feel like we don't use that much is the community wisdom aspect, is we have a whole community where this, like, this is a resource that I don't feel like we tap into, right? Like there are so many other people who have experienced this, who can be the rational side to your hyper emotionality side. Use them. You are not alone. Right. I, I think that we neglect or forget, lose touch with, however you want to phrase it, that, you know, you have family, you have friends, even acquaintances, like people who have been through this before and most likely can turn to or, you know, seek guidance or assistance or input or whatever about that. Um, yeah, we, we, I think, I think our society is very messy, obviously, from my earlier comments, but I think it's just difficult for people to kind of recognize like, oh, I have like a whole support structure available to me of, you know, but I kind of, we have the, we have a conflict Who's when it comes it? to individualism. We do. And then the other, uh, something else that we've talked about is, um, bitterness, jadedness, jealousy, right? Like sometimes that gets in the way, right? And we, we don't get happy for people, right? We want to feel what they're feeling. Um, so you know, and also sometimes that can be kind of nauseating. <laughs> well, You've and been I think, around somebody like that. I I think what is what tends to happen is it's easier for people to be supportive of others if you feel supported, like like to like. So if I'm happy in my life and I'm content and things are good, I'm much more amenable, agreeable open to being like that for other people who are having that happen for them. Fair. But, that if, but if that is not my life, that is not my perspective, then I think it is much more challenging, difficult, you know, to, to do that for another individual because you are, like I said earlier, I think there's a lot of reflection that happens. There's a lot of internal processing. Maybe it's subconscious. And so you kind of exhibit behaviors that are maybe not supportive. And, and, and go ahead. And is oh, and isn't it interesting that like I was saying at the beginning of this that we have an entire library of music that talks about love like a being like a drug, mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> but like when it happens, it's like oh my god, what's going on, right? Like they're acting like a crazy person. Um, 
And uh, that like, we're, we also have a culture that, uh, that says that you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to feel that way. That is abnormal. And yet it is normal. It is. <laughs> you, have li- you have little to no control over, over your emotions. Absolutely no control. Little, little to no control. Uh, the more I, I, control. I will agree with that. There's, there's, there's a lot of control we do have with our emotions, but there are points of ties such as like a new relationship energy. It's kind of like getting to that point where it's like, like you, you need somebody else to rein you in, really. Well, I think you could rein yourself in. Like, I think there is, I, I think. If you recognize it, that's, <laughs> right, a, right. that's like part that, of it. That's... It's like, I think this is where we're like a, a, a it ex- a example for the connection of um of like if you realize that you're having these is where when you can check yourself or and and like or at least get to the point where you can actually like like be like oh my gosh i know what i'm feeling i don't know how to control this help well because you don't have control and that's right. like because we we ha- we but if we, you recognize we, it we have we we uh, we are taught that we have some kind of semblance of control over our emotions. Um, that like we think that oh well I can do this and it'll make it better and then it it just makes it worse. Yeah, I, I think it's the the main thing is is being able to recognize it because right. once you recognize I, it, you can get at least some aware. semblance of control and at least take steps to have support for somebody. Like, well, you're still kind of in it you would at least have somebody that can help check you on it and well it's and it, i i would so. i would say that it's it's not so much control that is, is uh, that it is awareness and mindfulness um and responsiveness right because the like emotions are still there right like we we can't control them the only thing that we can do is respond to them Right, right. And so what I was going to say is like, I agree with everything you guys are saying. And and so sure, maybe not control, but I think awareness leads to acceptance. Yeah. And acceptance is key. Like, I don't know this for certain, but Ed, you might be able to, to like kind of course correct. It reminds me of like the addiction model concept, which is you have to have an awareness of the addiction before you can accept it. And then once you've accepted that you have this um, addiction in your life, whatever it may be, then you can adjust accordingly on what to do next. But if you don't have that, then it's much more difficult. And so that's why I was kind of like, not comfortable with the concept of like, you can't control your emotions. I'm like, no, I'm much more like in the alignment of like kind of a, a, I guess a Star Trek Spock concept or theory, which is that you can apply logic to a great many things. And and not so much that you disavow emotion, but more about that you can uh, you have the ability. It's a craft. It's a skill. It has to be learned. It has to be worked on constantly. But to take a different perspective, to not allow your emotions to determine your actions, if that makes sense. Mm hmm. Right. Um, But again, I would say that's more about like awareness and acceptance rather than control. Well, I think we use the word control as a default because we don't know how else to phrase it. Mm-hmm. But but I agree with you. Like once you have awareness and you have acceptance, then you can move into the next portions of your responsiveness. And that responsiveness, I think, is what we call control. Like yeah. how you address the the knowledge of what that thing is. Yeah, and control doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're getting rid of the emotion. It's just being able to be get those be like i have this emotion how am i going to handle the emotion and and work with it mm-hmm. um not necessarily get rid of it but work with it and and find that way either getting support or being like oh oh this is great this is great okay no i'm not going to move with him yet no just hold back hold back more dates yeah that's what we'll do oh oh right what's he doing so, right now so- text <laughs> 
<laughs> right. So that's when we when we talk about control, like when uh, when I talk about like controlling your emotions, um, like usually uh, people are like, well, I want them. I want them to go away. I want to avoid them. Um, I want to push them away. I want to avoid them. I want to fight them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, you can't. It's going to make it worse. Um, they're just going to come back stronger. Right. Um, and, you know, we 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 can't do that. So we we I feel like we're kind of this is a horrible analogy circling around the drain like we're 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 discussing kind of in a in a pattern of of going around or circling like the same ideas my question to you it is like how do we find that balance that we're discussing like what are some key things to to utilize I guess in our toolbox like when you well, have an energy happening or coming up or whatever well, use it. Um, use it to your advantage. So uh, like kind of like what we have been circling the drain about is to keep your head in the clouds, but your feet on the floor. Uh, so it's OK to, to feel those good feelings, but be practical. Um, so don't sign anything. Um, number one. Right. What do you mean by um, don't sign anything? Like don't anything. Don't uh, maybe don't sign maybe don't. the maybe if it's if the credit card receipt for for if you're at <laughs> at at a place that still has you sign sign that's probably okay for a signature. That's what I was thinking. But I any like, anything that might be binding, like oh, get in a new house. No. Okay. No. Yeah. Don't make any no. big purchases. No. Like so. So contractual obligations yeah. should be like viewed differently during this time frame. Exactly. Like for me, um, don't don't lease a brand new Jeep Wrangler the day after you complete your PhD coursework. Not that sounds that like a very specific, specific example. Yeah, that's a that's a very specific example. Um, but that that would be a uh, like don't don't sign your name to anything um, right after a really when you're in this kind of phase. You know, what just came to mind is this, uh, God, I haven't thought of this in a long time. Hang on a second. It's an, an what do we call those? Aphorism? Um, sayings, you know, that people pass down from generations. Um, I'm struggling at what the heck this thing is called. Uh, there. So there's this saying that just came to mind, and I don't know if this is the right way to phrase it, about don't cash a check that won't clear, or don't write a check. Don't, yeah, don't write, don't a, check. write a check with your mouth that you're, <laughs> is that the phrase? Something like that. Yeah. Um, Writing checks but, that you, you know, the... can't cash? I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, there's that too. Um But yeah, like the concept is like, you know, don't be uh, the advice is it is not in your best interest to write checks that you can't honor, I guess, is the way to put that. So and in your example that you were giving, it's like just because you are in a celebratory moment does not mean that you should financially burden or obligate yourself to the future that you don't know with certainty you can handle, I guess, is the way to. Be careful on taking your date out to an expensive restaurant. Exactly. So, you know, like, so my, my um, rule is I don't buy anything over $500 without consulting somebody first. Hmm. Interesting. That's something that my sponsor, that was a word of wisdom for my sponsor. And usually I'll sign, I'll talk to Jim or I'll talk to my sponsor. I said, hey, I'm thinking about getting this. Um, and usually they'll say, uh, can you wait until tomorrow? Yes. Okay. And then usually by tomorrow, I don't want it anymore. But when <laughs> you- <laughs> <laughs> right. Because the, cause the excitement wore off, like diminished from the potential of this thing. It reminds me of when I was going through credit counseling services in my past, in my 20s, and how I needed to buy a new car. And the bank would not give me the loan for the new car because I was using credit counseling services. They were like, well, you know, this shows that you're doing this whole process and we need assurance that you're going to be able to pay your monthly payment for the car. So I go to the credit counseling service company and I said to them, I need a letter from you stating that I am financially stable enough that I can afford the car. And the company refused. 
And it was very practical and wise. And this is the way it was explained to me by my credit counselor. And I have never forgotten it. I thought it was amazing advice. She said, Gary, she said, we're not going to put ourselves liable to your actions, your behavior by issuing this letter. Because then the bank will come back and say, but you said he could make his car payments. She said, so here's another way to look at it. If you wanted to go out and buy an elephant, you can go buy an elephant. I will advise you it's probably not in your best interest to go buy an elephant. I don't know if that's a practical use of your finance, you know, financial resources, but you have that ability. And I thought that was really intriguing how she phrased it. Like she was trying to help me like think really outside of the box. Like here's a non-conventional purchase that you could make. However, the impact of that you can't foresee. And the reality is perhaps you should not do that. Like there's two, there's two sides to it. You could do it or you could not do it. And so because of that, I have named my vehicles Ella, which is short for elephant, because I did end up stop using those credit counseling services. I was nearing the end of my term with them so that I could get the approval for the loan for the bank to be able to buy the car. Like, but it was a very practical, wise thing that I've always thought about when she was like, it was so funny that she said it so blatant, like flippant off the cuff. She was like, you go buy an elephant. I can't stop you. And I just sat there and I was like, why would I want to buy an elephant? But it was the whole point she was trying to make was. Dude, you could do anything you want in your life. I can't stop you. However, you should really think this through, like, and realize the responsibility that comes with such decisions mm -hmm. and what that means. And I was kind of like, whoa. So I think that's really interesting. Like, I think there's a parallel to what you said, Ed, like in the advice that you got, which was do not make decisions above this threshold, like, or within this realm, because there's no knowing if this is really the best thing, so to speak, for you, uh, which I find really interesting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, anything under $500 is, and, you know, that number can obviously uh, for change, some people, you might right? want to go with something a little lower, maybe two hundred, like a hundred bucks. Even. Yeah. Um, but like you know, I think that it's a a good um, accountability practice. I totally uh, agree. Like I I hadn't really thought of that before, but I think people we do get swept up in the emotion of something. And being like, oh, that would be so awesome, blah, blah, blah. Like, so as an example for my real life recently, my my television that I have is kind of getting a little wonky. Um, it's being a little bit of a pain in the ass and turning on and turning off with the remote. And I don't think it's the remote itself. I think like the infrared sensor or something, something's going with it. So in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, I might have to get a new TV. So then I go and I start looking at like, what are TVs on the market? Because I haven't bought a TV in like well, actually, technically in my life, I've never bought a television um, brand new. But, you know, I was like, oh, what are the features and things right now? And I was like, ooh, like I started getting swept up in the whole, like, look at all the the features and amenities and the things that they can do. And they're not all that expensive. And like, and I have to be really careful about that because that's an investment of some money. And right now, because of technology and advancement, like you can get things, I don't want to say relatively cheap, but could quote unquote affordable um, compared to when I was a kid. And like, you know, when you bought a, a an appliance, like it was a down payment investment. Like then again, things lasted much longer. So I remember when I was a child and we bought a console television. And let me tell you, like this was a huge thing. And we had it for, uh, how spells, like 15 years or something. So it, was definitively worth the money that we spent on it, but it wasn't something we lightly entered into as a family that we, that my parents had done. Um, and I try to rebalance that because I think a lot of that has changed with the availability of things. And unfortunately our disposable consumerist kind of reality now where, you know, it's kind of where I, this is a side tangent. I realized like, you know, people are just like, Oh, I can just buy another one of those. It's not a big deal. And it's like, well, actually, it is kind of a big deal, you know, because like what happens to the old one? What are we doing with it? And we haven't reached the age yet of Star Trek type technology where you can totally break something down to its core elements and then rebuild it into something else. We're not there yet. So, you know, if you dispose of something, where does it go? What is it happens to it? Is it, you know, upcycled or whatever you want to call it or recycled? So anyways. Uh, yeah, I hear that. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I realize there's no way to really kind of get back <laughs> to topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so the the other thing, uh, kind of like we talked about, um, is that NRE will kind of make you hyper focused on this, or can make you hyper focused on this one relationship. So it's important that you have regular check-ins with your friends and have uh, date nights with your existing partners. Mm -hmm. Um, So also to have yourself, hold yourself accountable to your existing relationships to counterbalance some of the cons of new relationship energy. and also use some of that NRE energy in your other relationships. So if you, since this NRE is going to give you the increased ability to try new things, you may be likely to try new things in your existing relationships. So it could... (laughs) have a beneficial relationship on your existing relationships if you allow it to. So use it to your advantage. During one of those date, date nights when you first had, had your raw tuna, tuna, then go on another date night with one of your other relationships and go have some raw tuna and introduce them to it. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, And that could. Right. Uh, So. And then the other thing is, unfortunately, um, maybe not unfortunately, is to recognize that this too shall pass. So NRE ends. Um, Research, you know, says that, uh, you know, the limerence phase or new relationship energy, those chemicals that we have. As we have all experienced it, we don't feel those things all the time. Um, Typically, it lasts about six months to two years. Um, So these feelings will end. Um, So I want to say this because I I just chuckled. I had this revelation just now um, that I've had NRE with my job because – I got a new job. So I like, it's very stimulating and it's exciting. And I have this thing and now I've been doing it for a year and a half. And I think part of that is happening within that job because now the day to day is more recognizable, even though I spent a, a, a vast majority of like the first year working on things that were not exactly my job. The, the challenge now is being engaged and just as like excited. Um, now, when I'm doing what needs to be done, that is the job and what that, what that means. And the, and, you know, I realize that some of what of my frustration is, is that I'm like, so this is it. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> and it's up to me to like, kind of to, to handle that, like to process it and work through it. And, you know, the challenges that I'm being presented with are not necessarily original or new, and they also are probably not going to resolve anytime real soon. So it's about me working through that and, and accepting what that is. And what I just realized in saying that is, is like, that can also happen in your relationships. I, I wonder uh, at how much there is, I don't know if there's been a lot of studies in, when the NRE diminishes, if that brings about the end of actual relationships. Do you know what I mean? Like, like um, when the, when you have come to the reality i don't know how else to phrase it uh you've reached the consistency of the the levels of you know activity pattern behavior whatever uh i'm just kind of spitballing because i'm trying to figure out how i want to say this like you reach normalcy mm-hmm. what's your normalcy like you like now you have you have the predictable patterns of of you and this relationship is it satisfying and if it isn't then what do you do about that? And I think I'm I'm curious to know how many times people are just like, oh, this isn't working for me anymore. Bye, you know, and so they get divorced or separated or whatever. Well, we can <laughs> we could talk for <laughs> hours on 
people's fear of secure relationships and Mm. that when things feel secure, they want to run away. (laughs) Right. So like when the newness, um, because that's, uh, you know, like the the last thing that we're going to talk about is old relationship en- energy or established relationship energy, right? Like when things are not new anymore and when things get secure, what do we do? Mm. Um, and that's that's typically when I'm seeing people is when things are secure. And that's when people feel like, well, this is insecure. Like I, um, and uh, I think it's really interesting to find security in, uh, to find security in established relationships. When like you feel like the partner that you're with doesn't know you anymore or doesn't want to know you anymore because we change, you know, like we're not the same person that we were at the beginning of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So like after like, you know, like six months or two years, like we're 10 years into our relationship. We feel like we know everything that there is to know about the other person. That's not true. I'm not the same person I was a month ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, um, so, you know, it's really easy to get to fall into that, um, uh that pattern of well i just know everything about them right there's nothing new anymore there's always something new and i find that intriguing because it's probably one of the most consistent things i have told everybody if the opportunity arises and in, in relevance you never fully know another person and people kind of have a tendency i think to push back on that and they're like well, I, I've been with this person, you know, I, I, my parents are my parents. I've known them my entire life. I'm like, yes, but that doesn't mean you know them. Like, you know, a version of them. But yeah. what I keep trying to tell people is you're not inside their brain. You literally have zero knowledge of the way they think. You know how they express themselves. Like, you know, they're like the, what they put out, but you don't know what the internal world is like. Yeah. And so it is completely possible to be in a relationship with someone and to have no knowledge of who they are on the inside. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's more a key um, point that you can work on to establish, to have very open communication, to help establish stronger bonds and a better relationship through that communication to talk about what's going on and how they feel and what's, you know, those type of things. But I think more often than not, at least here in American society, we don't want to do that. Like, you know. Well, so like, you know, so we're ta- so I, I guess so AJ, um, our new world uh, pet. Up, world pet uh, just or posted this old relationship energy article, um, which was on a, a poly um, website um, and and Gary sent it to me and I had never <laughs> seen this before. Uh, and and the the article defined it as the dynamic of a longstanding established romantic or sexual relationship. It's related to the Greek concept concept of pragma or mature love, also known as compassionate love, um, also known as ORE, old um, relationship energy. Um, mm-hmm. And in um, looking in other uh, research or articles, uh, in poly circles it's also called established relationship energy and existing relationship energy and it's uh and in some critical uh discourse also called um what what do they call it um what's a e word entitled relationship energy Mm. yikes (laughs) yikes um which we don't want. Uh, so the with this, it's the dichotomy between um, compassionate love and limerence um, being secure, a secure attachment with somebody and having an insecure attachment with somebody 
as a new relationship. Um, and they use a analogy of, um, you know, feeling comfortable playing an instrument that you are comfortable with. I have, uh, I find a fault with that, <laughs> uh, that we're using somebody um, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, mm. But I get the analogy. My problem with this is that's not usually my experience when working with couples who have been together for a long time. They sometimes feel like they have been together for a long time, um, but they are not the same instrument and that the the other partner doesn't want to play with them anymore and doesn't know doesn't know how to play with them anymore and has forgotten how and doesn't want to ask them how to play with them anymore. OK, so that was a lot of stuff. And I want to go back real briefly because I think you said about three or four different things in that last statement. And the one that spoke the most to me was that they don't know how to play. And I think mm -hmm. it's that they never did. So they probably they probably did at some time. Like they there there probably was a a good connection at one point, but over the years, they have they might have grown some distance. Right. So if we're using the musical instrument analogy, there's a difference between being able to muddle through something and actually mastering it. And mastering is not the right term, but that's the way it's phrased within the community is that you obtain a high level of skill with that. And so I think back to when I started learning musical instruments in my past, when I was much younger, like I learned to play a trumpet and I could get through, like I could, you know, play music with it. I never really, you know, got greatly skilled at it, um, but I, you know, didn't see the reason that I needed to continue that once I moved on to other things. And so I, I think like there's a there's a definitive thing about this notion. So the the idea of companionate or companionate love, this concept of security is interesting because what they're trying, I think, to say is there's something there's a, a there's a reliability in the oldness of things. I don't think it's the right way to phrase it, but like you can, there's, there is, there's some security in returning to something or knowing that something's there that's longstanding or has been established. I'm not necessarily saying it's healthy. Um, I think your point is well taken, you know, that uh, definitely this, the concept or the, the example of using another person is very faulty. Um, so there's much better ways probably to phrase it that aren't coming to mind at the moment. But I, th I find it interesting that, the, I think what they're talking about is like existing relationship energy or old relationship energy is that there's a there's a comfort in the security of that existence, um, a reliability, yes. I guess. I like so I what I appreciate about this uh, analogy is practice, right? That like mm -hmm. um, that's an analogy that I often use that uh, every relationship, every kind of um, skill that we develop uh need we have to practice it we have to work at it right that these things are just just don't happen overnight and that like we can develop this skill but like the the longer that we don't communicate the longer that we that we don't try to um understand the other partner that we're with um the longer that we're not going to be able to relate to that instrument right maybe we forget how to play a few notes right um and uh and you know we're we're not as quick to to do that um yeah, i'm learning well, so, that the, the 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 instrument is definitely not that great of an analogy well i think that there's one key thing to think about this and it's and it's maintenance mm -hmm. so like yeah. as an example, this is going to be a odd uh, example, I guess, in a way. But like, so when once I started learning the trumpet, and my parents decided that, like I said, I was going to stick with this, then they invested and bought me a, a, a Doc Severinsen model, um, brand new trumpet, and I had it for several years. And then I went off to college, and I had switched musical instruments that I was focused on. My cousin 
had expressed an interest who was younger than me in learning and ended up, uh, you know, wanting to learn the trumpet. And so we made the decision since I wasn't really utilizing it to give it to them. Well, I don't want to say give. My impression was I was loaning it to them. Uh huh. And I've never seen it another day since then. And every once in a while, I kind of ref- reflect fondly and be like, gee, I wonder whatever happened to that. And part of that is a nostalgia. But another part of it is like, did you did you maintenance it? Did you take care of it? Like, did you give it the 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 love, quote unquote, that I would expect of such a thing? Did you, you know, oil the hinges? Did you clean it? Did you make sure that like there weren't, you know, fingerprints on it that would cause corrosion over time? Like, like, I think that's another aspect of this, this thing where they're talking about like the caretaking of what that thing is over time. Not only is there practice for familiarity of your skills and like, and finessing them and becoming better at them, but more importantly, the maintenance of that thing whatever right. that that is and we could still use this analogy um like i would just i would just want to um resist the urge to refer to the other person as the instrument rather the relationship is the instrument um uh the relationship itself it are yeah and like we could say that we're both playing an instrument and we're making like beautiful music together like i'm playing a friggin trumpet and gary's playing a uh what's a really good oh gary's actually playing a uh a, like um um we're both playing the trumpet and like we're we're playing some really good harmony together mm-hmm. yeah mm. you get what i mean but like the the analogy that i tip the analogy that i typically use with my couples is a uh is a bank account what are you putting into the bank account mm-hmm. what deposits are you making right um i like that analogy better Right, um, because you're because you're both investing, haha, um, yeah. and you know, like you're both collectively responsible for this, you know, existing account. And yes, it does take deposits and it takes withdrawals, and you know, it will increase with interest over time. You know, it can it be, can become more than what it is, especially when it's combined together. But it takes that kind of commitment and again like i i like i like the idea i don't know why it's just resonating with me the concept of maintenance um and that's one of the things i think that we've really lost quite a bit is that folks just expect something to take care of itself like it will be okay and you hear these horror stories about people who like own a vehicle and they've like they never take it in for an oil change or tire rotations or whatever and then they're like i don't understand why my engine blew up and you're like "Mm, because you just beat it up (laughs) <laughs> like you didn't take care of it like you just right. abused it and used it quote unquote um you know that that that's the thing i one of the key pieces i think that we're missing in the modern day is like you can have things last for a very long time you can actually make things outlast their expected life you know uh number if you take care of them like I was thinking of this analogy I gave last night with my best friend. We were having this random conversation about just life. And I said, I saw a meme recently that made me laugh. And it was about how you could buy an appliance today and it'll last you X amount of years, like, you know, three to six years or less than 10 years, whatever. And the picture was of a of a vintage 1980s refrigerator. And it said, you know, or you could have a 1980s refrigerator and this refrigerator will outlive you. Like, you know, and it, the concept of the meme was talking about how, like, we used to make things to last versus things that had a limited life, sh- like shelf life and expectancy. Mm-hmm. And m- my thought is actually the things we have today could last longer, but you need to take care of them. Like, you need to to be aware that this does have a limited expectancy and you can extend it, but you have to you have to make the commitment. You have to put in the time and the effort to make it more than what it is in that case. Right. Um, so I think in talking about NRE versus um, ORE uh, is that something to consider when ha- experiencing NRE is you should you could also be working on your ORE as well um to like put to making those deposits into your ORE 
bank account as well to strengthen that. OREs just in in our OREs are are like an IRA, while the NRE is like a checking account. That your what the that that are potentially future IRAs. Right. I I think that you know the the concept of financial security is an interesting model. I don't know if everyone can relate to it. Um, only because I was just having this conversation last night with my best friend about like how messed up American society is because of racism. Anyways, um, there's just, you know, financial inequity, period. That's all there is. Uh, really, I don't want to get into that too much. But no, I think the concept of what you're discussing is fair, you know, that and the reality is, I guess the way I would look at it is like you could open an account together. So it is an NRE, but it will slowly over time convert to an ORE and how healthy that ORE is, is about your commitment to that. Like you're refocusing, you're addressing it, your maintenance of it, like, as opposed to just leaving it alone and expecting it to be okay. Exactly. And to let it, de- to let it develop naturally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think we have a tendency to just, I don't want to say abandon, but we presume something's going to be okay. And, you know, we see these, you know, unfortunately, these stories shared of where, you know, people are abandoned or left alone or whatever, and it's not a good situation, you know. Um, And you just kind of question what the heck that's about. Yep. Which makes sense. Yeah. Um, And the other thing... I think the last thing that I wanted to mention is that you are responsible for your NRE. Mm -hmm. Um, You are not responsible for um, other people's feelings. Right. So like if the, you like, so the, the, um, the phrase that I kind of came up with, you're responsible for your new relationship energy. You're not responsible for your partner's jealousy. That's their responsibility. Mm. Yeah. Well, Interesting. You, you could probably help by ma- helping to maintain your ORE with them, but you're not really responsible for it. But part of your new relationship energy responsibilities are to maintain your ORE. That's fair enough. Right. And I think that speaks to the conflict I was mentioning earlier where people outside of the NRE get upset or bothered or jealous or whatever. Like they have these negative reactions because they feel that perhaps their, their current ORE is being abandoned or not maintenanced or upheld. And I would say that for um, a partner that feels jealous, their to-do list is to, um, to work on their secure relationship bond with their partner. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Cool. Yep. Hey, I see you got a bunch of resources for us here. Mm-hmm. Um. Yep. These are just the uh, you know, uh, blog articles that I, I, I drew from. Um. That you can also look at. Um. And they will also take you to other blogs like Polyland. Um. And Bustle, which has a lot of really good, um, relationship content and. And findpoly.com. And all these will be in our show notes. So if you, anybody wants to, to take a look at them, just uh, pop over to our website, comesoutloud.com. If you're a patron, you'll be part of the pastry post too. But I, I think it's about that time. But first, Ed, I think you would like to recommend something to people. Oh, um, yeah. If there are any um, kinky people of color out there, um, I have a really good friend who is a PhD student who just launched her research study for her um, dissertation. Um, And uh, she's looking for um, kinky kinky people of color um, who have participated in, um, uh, participated in, give me a sec, uh, in-person BDSM spaces or contexts in the United States within the past 24 months. Um, the This research is going to, or uh, 
will amplify and center the voices of kinky people of color, and the result may benefit the larger community. Um, this is a 20 to 30 minute survey, um, and it's going to ask you about experiences of racial or ethnic discrimination, sexual self concept and coping within these spaces. Uh, the link for this survey will be in the show notes and um, participants may also choose to enter into a drawing to win one of four $25 uh, gift cards. Mm, incentive. Yes. I'm really intrigued by this. Um, and I'm thinking about how, how to approach people that I know that I think could participate in this without coming across as like a Caucasian asshole. <laughs> you know, like, I think there's a delicacy because I just don't want to like send it to people and be like, you should do this. You know what I mean? Like, um, I definitely think there are people that could could find this to to be of interest to them. And more importantly, what the, the results would be. Exactly. I just realized someone I could connect with, possibly, who works out of a research center on the West Coast related to kink. Interesting. Well, if you want to send this, I would send the 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 verbiage right. um, as well as the link. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Let's share it in the entourage chat, too. Yeah, it's a person who's presented at CLAW. Um, several years ago, someone oh, I had neat. An, an interest in bringing on as a guest at one point. They had they had a really interesting. I sat, I never knew them. Sat in a session, a lecture that they gave, and I was really kind of like, whoa! It's all about the the psycho um, aspects of the psych psychological aspects of kink and BDSM, mm -hmm. and I found that I was like, whoa! Like I never really thought of that. Because I was honestly, I was very ignorant. Like in my mind, you know, this was when I was aware of kink, but I hadn't really thought a whole lot about it. So I was being very. Um, Went to Claw to get educated. Right. Well, I was being very myopic. Like I was very limited in my view. And in, in my mind, I was like, oh, this is just people who want to beat each other up. Baby, it no. is so much more than that. <laughs> nope. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Coolio. kind of in some sense, but. Not exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I, Absolutely. All these links, including the link to the uh, survey, um, is will be on our website, from and, and mine is coming within the month. Which Hopefully. We, which we will be, be promoting. Because, hey, you, you help us out here a lot, so we want to help you. And I, I hope that there's a lot of people who will be able to participate. <laughs> All of a sudden you get like 50,000 responses. And it's like, that oh, would, wait a minute. That would be incredible. Now I need to. And a lot of data to sit through. Sit through. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I hate to say it, kids, but I think that's the end. Oh. Oh. Plenty of ways to contact us. Um, again, all these links to the surveys and, and everything you find over at comesoutloud.com. Uh, if you'd like to shoot us an email, uh, you can do that at comesoutloud at gmail.com. Voicemail at 361 talk. That's 361-265-8255. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at comesoutloud in the appropriate place of the URL. Uh, you can join our entourage chat uh, at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. Find out when we're planning to do these shows, such as, I believe our next show will actually be uh, playing some games on next Saturday. Right. This coming Saturday, uh, for those of you that are listening and or watching, uh, Jeff's birthday's coming up. So uh, we decided instead of doing the power hour, we're calling it a happy hour. So you're welcome to bring along a beverage and snacks of your choice. Um, I'm as opposed to spending 60 minutes trying to drink every minute, uh, we're going to play games online. And you're welcome to join, to participate, to watch, uh, to chat. And yeah, we're going to take what we did a little bit from this past week with the, the Jackbox games and have some fun. 
we so this time we know what we are actually doing. Uh, but you can find <laughs> out when we're planning on recording all those at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. Uh, you can also get various Kutermon by going to our uh, merch store at Zazzle uh, slash Cubs Out Loud. I say it that way because, hey, Zazzle has sites in different countries, which provides the country's local currency and probably cheaper shipping. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's slash Cubs Out Loud uh, for whichever site. You could get something like a Cubs Out Loud logo shirt, consent of my four play shirt. Like Gary's got mm-hmm. hats, which are kind of blurry because the screen is a folk. Uh, the, 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 it's just blurry. There it is. And uh, various other accoutrements. Uh, don't forget, uh, some of those shirts, such as the Consent is My Foreplay, is done, done by Smashy, and he has his own place at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. Uh, so please do support him as well. Uh, subscribe to you can also subscribe to us at patreon at patreon.com slash cubs out loud where you get the full show in your podcast feeds and access to the vod for the live live show uh and if you just want to send us a donation paypal.me slash cubs out loud just a little bit of cash you find us at apple podcast uh google play podcast spotify uh, amazon novel um and you can find me anywhere in the internet it's box set box poppy box cup box something or other and Windjam, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M on Twitch, where I host Bears and Dragons, and which this season is coming to the end. Um, and we'll be having another campaign after this one. Um, don't know the specifics of everything that's happening with that. but And uh, I'll be streaming a little bit later. That's me, Gary. Nice. If you want to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GaryBear73. And, Ed, if people would like to get in touch with you, uh, how would they do so? Uh, well, you can find me on uh, Instagram as unicub underscore sex brain wizard. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Edward AC. Um, I have a website, eactherapy.com. Um, I'm on TikTok as unicub79. And if you want to see some um, NSFW uh, content uh you can see me on twitter at jeep daddy three um but just send me a request and a message because i don't need family friends or clients on there thank you <laughs> all right and with that i'm going to do this say good night everybody uh good night everybody <laughs> Ciao for now. <laughs>